Hello guys, welcome back to the Beastie Room. Something totally different today. I've been noticing a lot in um, the social media, Facebook and what have you, talk of um, incubators. Now, as you're all well aware, some of these incubators run into some uh, serious money. They are very expensive, but they are very good. But um, what we have been doing for many, many years in the reptile hobby and the spiders is um, we've been making our own. Now this is a very, what I'm going to take you through now is a very cost effective way of making an incubator for your spider room. And it's really, really simple. It really doesn't need to be difficult. And um, so what we're going to do, what we basically got here, this is normal shelving units that you can buy from anywhere, B&Q, whatever. Um, I got this stuff at a local merchant's and uh, this is all off cuts. So they, basically a 10 foot length of this cost me, I think it was like three pound a length. So it's very, very cheap. This is, um, this is what they call it, this is a fire retardant with this one. It doesn't need to be, it could be any kind of timber really. Now what we've done is we've already measured it out. We've marked out where we need to do our cuts. It's made very simple as well because we want our incubator to be roughly uh, 12 inches deep. Well, these here are literally one foot and a quarter inch. So it's ideal, perfect. And the reason we've gone for that size is because these are what we use as our nursery pots. These are just the, the normal deli cups that you get. And we can afford, by having them a foot deep, we can afford to get two, two in there like that. So too deep, and then the length that we want to go. Now we've gone, we can make this any size you want. What I've done here is I've made it to fit in here. Now all you regular guys will know, this is where I store all my rubbish, all my bits and pieces and everything. So that's all we're going to have to find a new home. But what we're going to do is we're going to build our incubator to sit inside this spot here. And then it's close at hand, it's on the bench, everything's nice and easy. So. This is the idea behind it. We want it to be too deep for all of our uh, egg sacs and our slings that we get off. And then we've made it 23 inches because that's the width of the, uh, the bench. So we've made it to fit the bench. So it will keep it all nice and neat. Now being 23 inches, I believe that will give us four pots long. So we can end up with eight on the bottom and it's going to be high enough but eight on the top, that's 16 pots. More than enough, more than enough. We don't breed that much. So then, what we're gonna do now is we are gonna pop outside. We're gonna cut all of this. It won't take long, simple cuts. And we will be back to put it all together. And we'll see how we go. All right, come with me, let's crack on. Right, here we are then. We've moved outside, this is gonna be a dusty job. We've got our power saw, we've got everything made up where we want it to be. So all we've got to do now is cut it. Timber cut, we're ready to go now. I <laughs> believe we were outside, would you? Now, then, this is um, this is basically uh, what we call egg crate. This is plastic, and uh, this is what I use on my aquariums. Now, um, we are going to cut this exactly the same using our saw. 
So this has been measured already. Now because obviously we can't draw on this, so I've put some white tape down here and that will give me my line that I need to follow. And we do the same on the other side. So we'll give this a try. Down, double check. Yes. Remember, measure twice, cut once. Here we go. Perfect. Right, let's go back inside, put it together. So you should. Oh. Right then, we've been out and we've cut all our timber. And as you saw, it was fairly easy. Now, one thing to make sure, one worth mentioning, is. This is a very, very simple um, procedure that we're doing here. You don't need power tools. There is no need to have a, a, a power saw. You can get away with a hand saw. We're literally only cutting these, which is basically shelving. Um, so yes, you can get away with literally a hand saw and a drill. That is pretty much all we need. We don't need anything else really. So we're keeping it nice and simple. Now, what we've done here is we've also cut some pieces of battening which are going to fit inside our end pieces these are the, on the ends of our thing now the reason for this is so that when we put our shelf on they've got something to sit onto now um, we can put that there in there like so and we've marked it off so what we're going to do now is we are going to drill a couple of pilot holes in there so we know we've got our depth so we need to be in there so we're going to come in a little bit from the end always come in a bit from the end otherwise you run the risk of um, splitting your wood so we just make sure we're all square everywhere and then we'll literally just plow that in there and there actually gone all the way through so we're just going to double check so we keep that. that one's through that one's through right that's it that's good we've also done our pilot holes on the ends so we've done exactly the same thing we just marked it and we put our pilot holes through now the reason we do that is to make it a little bit easier for when we put our screws in one thing is it will line them up nice and accurately and two, it takes the pressure off of the wood so that when we're going into the ends of the wood, it's not quite so dense and they can actually go through there without fear of it splitting the wood. We shouldn't split the wood by doing our pilot holes. If we went directly in, 
there's a good chance the screw will go off in a funny angle or whatever. If you're not perfectly square with it, it can go off in whatever angle it feels fit to, to be honest. So we've done that, we've got that bit in there, and we've marked our wood. So now we can place this one in here, like so. It's not going to work like that, is it? We just need to play around a little bit. There we go. Got a pilot hole. Let's place that in there. doing is literally just starting these off so we can see where they are and once they've started we can place it down put them in properly all they need to do right that is our ends in so all we need to do now Make a little bit of space. I'm going to bring our base up. Offer our end up like so. Now, what you can do here is what I always do is this is going to be the face edge, the front of the, the um, incubator. So I always make sure the front is absolutely perfectly square and nice. Because if there is any discrepancies, then if they happen at the back, it's not really going to make a lot of difference. So all we can do now... in there like so. Same with this side, bearing in mind now that our front edge has changed, it's now on this side, so we make sure that's square. You always put the front fascia one in first. Just needs to bite, that's all. Then. So far, so good. Let's just reposition this one. That's it, that's it. Now 
Now then, we've got our top here. And the easiest thing to do now is to turn this up the other way. Uh, this is going to be the front. You can see now it's starting to make a little bit, a little bit of shape. Now this is the front, I'm just going to turn it up the right way, so here we go, this is now the front, and you can see there it's just a very simple design, all we want to do now is we want to put our back on, so we're going to lay this down, and we've got our back here. Now because our, um, our incubator is taller than it is wide, we've had to have used two pieces. So we've got another piece here and that will fit in the back like so. Now we can pre-drill these again. We can do this in situ. So we've got one here. basically our box and we are there so what we're going to do is we are going to attach our heat mat like so that looks better doesn't it that's much better and we can use some soil um, some silver um, foil tape to tape that to the back wall and that will keep that in position so all we need to do now, really, is drill a hole down here to take the, uh, the electric supply outside. So we can do that, and then with that in place there, we can have our shelf in place, and you'll see there, that's all starting to make a little bit of sense. Yeah? Right. So what we need to do now is take that out, we can swap, we'll just literally do a pilot hole so we know where our electrics are going to go. And 
we can tuck that in there. And we can change that out for a larger hole to take our electrics. So that's going to be that there. Now we've got we've got our tracking. This is our glass tracking. This is just a regular, normal regular glass tracking and you'll notice on this you have a top and a bottom you see and what we do is the wider one the, the deeper one that will sit you can put them still for a stay so it'll um, Oops, just focus sorry. in and if you move it away from the black background that'd be cool and cool yeah so what are the taller ones? So we put the taller one on the top, go up here, and we put the shorter one on the bottom. And all we do with these is we just plop them in like so. We can mark them with our Stanley knife. Like so. And you should be able to cut these with your Stanley knife. These ones are particularly tough plastic actually. Once we cut that we can just bend it and that should go. A little bit too long. As you can see there, that didn't quite go square. So what we'll do is we'll these are normally a little bit softer than this. There we go. There we go. And what we will do is we will silicon that in so that it sits nice and properly. We do the same with this one. So we can silicon these into place and we can now drill our thing and then we can get our glass cut. Right. I think we'll leave it there. Well then guys, we'll take our shelf out and what we've done is we've put our heat mat on the back and you can see all we've done is we've drilled it in here. Now the reason we put the heat mat on the back wall is because we will get a better gradient of heat. I did toy with the idea of putting it in the roof, but as we all know, heat rises. But being in an enclosed uh, situation, it will actually, it would warm this up. But I think by having it on the back, we should get a better gradient of heat. So we've run our cable straight out the back and um, here it is here and we can literally attach that to our pulse thermostat and that will heat this whole entire area perfectly so what we're going to do now is we've got our um, our track in here now we've cut it top and bottom and we've also got some bits to go down the side and the reason for the side bits is one it will finish it off but also as well it will also act as a seal so that we're not allowing heat to you know leave prematurely so what we're going to do is we are going to put these on here like so and we're going to we've got our silicon 
And we don't need a lot, a lot in the way of uh, silicon. So we are literally going to just put a nice gentle bead. there there we go have a good little tip here when you finish with your silicon if you take a screw and put it in the end when you come to use it next time, it will be easier just to break this little bit out, so you don't end up using the whole the whole nozzle full of glue. So what we're going to do, we place the thinner piece on the bottom, and that goes in there like so. We just gently push that down. As you can see now, this is why we don't put too much on. You can see we've got a little bit of seepage here. So all we do, we just lick our finger and run that down through there. And that will clean that off. Okay. the same with the top and we put the wider piece on the top you should just squeeze that up You can see where we've gone a little bit thicker with the with the silicon there. And literally just take that piece off. Like so. When this dries we can clean it off of the plastic. side pieces here. Exactly the same. Do you use a thin bit or a thick bit on the sides? Well we've got leftovers for both. So we're going to have a thick bit on one end and a thin bit on the other. There's no point in buying extra tracking for the one little piece. So, you just get them in there like so. And we can do the same with this one. should do it. Oh, 
And what we do now is we leave this to dry and we'll give this a good 24 hours just to dry off and make sure it's absolutely sealed. It's better not to rush this part. And then what we can do while we're waiting for this, we can go and cut our glass and get that prepared. So we should leave this now. Let's go do the glass. Right. Before we go and cut our glass, we're going to paint it. And I think what we'll do is we're just going to paint the outside. We're not really worried about the inside. It doesn't need to be... Um, I'm going to paint it black so it matches the room. But we don't really need, it doesn't need to be light on the inside, so we're not, we're not going to worry too much. So all we're going to do, this is a blackboard paint, same paint that we've used in the rest of the room. And we, uh, we tend to cover all wood areas with this stuff. It's not very smelly either, it's very good stuff. So we can pretty much paint this and go straight in with it. That's it. We'll just allow this to dry. We'll come on for our second coat. Now we're going to do the glass. Right, hello guys. Here we are. We're back outside again. We've finished our painting for the moment, so now we're going to do the glass. Now, uh, this is something that I've been doing for many, many years. This is a, uh, a double glazed unit which I found in a skin. Now, with this stuff, obviously it's free, so this is really good. If you see a kite mark, the British standard kite mark in the corner, it could be in any one of these corners, it will be of no use to you because the glass will shatter. If you get one with no kite mark, so there's no markings on the glass at all, this, is, this will be fine. You'll be able to cut this glass. With the kite mark, you cannot cut it shatter. So what we're going to do now is, it's a little bit finicky and we need to get a little bit of, bit of wedge off. So we need a, a standing knife, but we've obviously got two sheets of glass here. Now they've got an aluminium strip that runs through the edges, and that is what we need to cut. So we're going to find the edge of the glass, put our blade in there, and we're literally just going to pull it through like so. You do have to be very careful. Don't want to go chopping your legs off with your hands. You'll see it's quite simple. See there, it's gone all the way through. So you run it round. cut deep enough you can start to you can see where the blade sits in there there we go. So what we've got to do is we literally just got to tease this piece off so we just keep 
keep working our way around. bit of effort. The longer it's been sitting in here, the harder it is. It's like glue. Peel that off. You see there, it's come away. I'm going to cut that down there. It should. Try not to do. Move that over there. Now, hopefully, we've got enough glass here to do the job that we want. So, what we've got to do now is literally just clean off these edges, but be a little bit gentle. This is quite old glass, so it can be a little bit on the brittle side. So what we can do now, what we need to do now is measure it. So we'll need to measure our box find out what our measurements are and I'm pretty sure we should be able to come across here and that will give us our two pieces and be more than enough. Right, let's just get our tools back in a sec. Right, so here we are, we're back out on the glass. What we're going to do now is we're going to measure our piece of glass. So we've already worked out that we needed 34 and a half centimetres high. So we'll mark that in there. 34 and a half. I'll use a felt tip on the glass because it's easier. We'll get rid of that. We've got our straight edge. Mark that there. Really, we probably don't need to mark it like that. As long as we've got our straight edge there, you can see. Now, we've got our glass cutter. Now, this is an old trick that was uh, shown to me. That if you keep oil on the wheel of your glass cutter, it will cut better. Did you see that fly off then? Unbelievable. Right. What we do, we just put a little bit of WD-40 on the wheel. Now bearing in mind, when you cut this, 
we don't want to put too much pressure on the wood because we'll end up breaking it, which does sometimes happen. So what we're going to do is we've, drew, we've drawn our lines. If you come and have a look at this, you can see we've got our line there and our straight edge is off to the side. So what we're doing is we're looking at the cutting edge of the wheel there and we want to get that on our line. So you can see that's where we are. That follows all the way through. That's perfect. Absolutely perfect. Now, one very important thing to remember when cutting glass is that you only want to score it once. So we are going to go straight across once. If you score it a second time, the chances are it won't follow the same line and you'll end up with a kink in it and we'll end up with broken glass. So only ever score it the once and we want moderate pressure. So we're literally going to put that in there right to the edge and we're going to go. Hopefully that was enough. We will find out. What we're going to do now is we're going to take all our bits off. What I tend to do is the piece of glass that I want to save I keep on the board and the piece of glass that I want to lose I take to the edge. We should, this is where a, um, a confident glass cutter would just snap this. I'm not quite so confident. In actual fact, glass terrifies me. So, um, yeah, I don't like this bit at all. So what we do, we literally, we can get hold of it and we're just going to snap it. Maybe not. Right, hold there. Give it a little tap. See if that done the job. There we go. It's off. So this is now the right size for what we want. We've got some glass sandpaper here. Just run that down there. It just takes off any nasty edges. So then, because we're using second-hand glass, we look for the best corner, which is this one. going to do, we're going to measure again. So this time we want to be twenty-eight centimeters long, which equated to fifty-six, didn't it? Yes. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut our fifty-six first, which is here. Get a little bit more oil on our stone again. Our blade. I'm going to cut this one. Now another interesting thing here is quite often the smaller the piece of glass that you're cutting off, the harder it is to actually snap it off. Remember, one pass for the blade. Let's see. It didn't look very good. do 
do is something thin to pass to pass underneath that. Two seconds. Put that under there like so. help take it just gives it that edge I actually broke away okay All right. so far so good now then all we need to do now is cut this one in half so we'll check our measurement 56 that's good 56 Half of 56, camera lady? 28. Oh, she speaks. <laughs> right, Very tempting to go back and do a second pass, but we must refrain. So again, we've got our edge there. Yeah. It's okay, my dear. <laughs> Perfectly safe. the edge. Hopefully snap. Yay. Now we can all breathe a sigh of relief. So what we're going to do now is we're literally just going to take off any edges. Be careful when you're doing this. Um, end up cutting a finger. cleaning them just yet because we're going to try them and see if they work. Let's go and see if they fit shall we? Right well here we are we come back now we just need to try these pieces of glass and hopefully they fit. Let's see how we go. So what I normally do is I put the back one in first and it's what we're in the back. Right, 
So all we've got to do now is give these a nice clean, smarten them up a little bit. They're not the best pieces of glass, but they'll be, they'll be fine. They're more than adequate. They do the job nicely. So we can literally, we'll clean these up. It's already painted. That is project finished almost. We'll put it into place and we'll see how it looks. So right, come back shortly. Gonna give these a clean, get it into place. I'll see you in a moment. Hello guys, well, here we are. This is our finished uh, article. And I think you might agree, it looks rather smart. We've got um, our glass here. Now you can see in here with the uh, thing, we've got this running with a heat mat in the back. You remember we put the heat mat on the back. That's a 20 watt heat mat. And uh, we're running that off of a pulse thermostat. A digital pulse thermostat. Now uh, what we got is we've literally got that on the on the side here. Now one thing I will say actually looking at this if you just come back and have a little look at that if you follow in on here and you'll, you'll see this is your dial. Yeah zoom in a little bit zoom in. Right you've got your dial here. Now don't take any real notice of these numbers because 80 degrees on here might not be 80 degrees in there so just as a um, word of a word of warning do not rely on the gauge on your thermostats because they're invariably wrong yeah a lot of people get into trouble with these, they take them out of the box, they set it for whatever temperature they want, put it all up, set it up, go away, come back and find they've cooked everything. And this is because that dial is literally a generic dial. It's not calibrated to that precise temperature. So what you want to do is get a, a, a thermometer that you trust, that you know is doing a good job, put that inside and then adjust your thermostat to your thermometer. So like for ours, we've set it at 80 degrees inside our incubator. And we will leave this running for a good 24 hours, maybe a little longer, until we can fine tune it and get it exactly where we want it. But always run off of the temperature that your thermometer inside your incubator is telling you. Do not trust your thermostat. So, with that being said, this is our end product. And as you can see, we've got enough room in the top for our pots. We can actually get eight of our pots in here on the top shelf. Um, and then we've got enough, enough room down below for um, a bra blast uh, container. There's more than enough. You could get two in there, one on top of the other. Um, and this is ideal, so you don't have to only use your incubator for your x -ax. You can also use it for tiny slings, if you've got delicate slings and things like that that need a steady temperature, and maybe your room doesn't hold a steady temperature. If you've got um, delicate slings, then this could well be the, envir the environment that will, that will actually get them through, especially when they're very, very small. So you can use this for a number of things. At the end of the day, it is a heated box, and it's exactly uh, it does exactly that. It holds a good temperature. Now, we we saw how reasonably easy this is to make. If you're um, if you don't mind a little bit of a challenge, and you know your your woodworking skills are just adequate, that's all you really need. Then this is easily feasible with the glass. I appreciate not everyone's happy cutting glass. I'm not particularly happy myself. It scares the life out of me. So you can actually buy the glass. You can make your box, go to your local glass shop, give them the measurements that you require, and they will cut the glass for you. And you'll get it done for a couple of quid. It's not expensive at all. The whole point of this project is to save us money. Now, um, you're thinking that the average incubator on the market at the moment is you're looking at around anywhere between 150 and 250 pound. That's a rather large outlay. So this is a 
a cheap alternative that does exactly the same job. Now, um, you'll also know, some of you reptile people out there, this looks very, very similar to a small reptile viv. And it is, to all intents and purposes, a small reptile viv with a shelf in it. So, if you're not very good at making uh, it from scratch, then why not just go out and buy yourself a small reptile viv. You can get one for this sort of size for about £60. Put your heat mat on the back. Hey presto, just put a shelf in, your job done. Again, another real cheap way of doing it. So hopefully, I hope this has given you some ideas and um, it really does benefit our egg sacs and our slings, our young spiders, because it gives them that stable environment. So it's very, very useful. Um, it now means that I can put my stuff in here and open the door and leave the door open for a little while or whatever. I'm not, I've not got to worry about my egg sacs. They would be perfectly fine, perfectly happy. Right. Well, that was quite some video I might add. It took a little while to put together. And uh, we had much fun on the way. <laughs> Camera ladies rolling her eyes. Right then. I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope it's going to be of use to some of you. And don't forget, be calm, be gentle, and love your spiders. I'll see you soon, guys.